So today, today is the final part of Family uh, God's Way, Family God's Way, which is a mini-series in our bigger series, Bible 101. And first week, uh, we looked at Marriage God's Way. Last week, Kathy Madavan taught on Parenting God's Way. I was just saying there weren't more parents here, but uh, because of the wonderful uh, joys of technology and the wonderful efforts of Maxine, you can go and watch it either on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. You can have a catch up and see what Kathy talked about parenting God's way and the legacy that we pass on to uh, our children. Today we look at uh, blended families and what the Bible has to say about that. So what is um, a blended family? Oh, there we go. Well, Mike... Uh, Mazalongo, what a great name. He says this about blended families. He said, today we have a variety of blended families. There are subsequent marriages where children are brought together from different unions, single parents with children from different partners, grandparents raising grandchildren, multi-generational families where parents live with their children or relatives, family who had adoptive or abandoned children to their household, etc. So, there are lots of definitions or types, if you like, of blended family. And this topic, this blended family, is actually too big to cover uh, in one sermon or indeed in several sermons. So I want to draw just out a few things today in, as we look at this area of family life God's way so that we can go and think and we can go and study uh, it further for ourselves. And I want to split this morning's message into three sections. Firstly, where we see blended families in Scripture. Secondly, three key areas to be mindful of uh, if you are part of a blended family, or even if you're not, you never know what the future holds. And thirdly, how we as the church are perhaps the largest blended family and how we are to live together. So firstly, Let's look at some people in Scripture that were part of blended families. So there are three examples. The first one is this guy, Abraham. Abraham, rather. Abraham. He was called Abraham, and then God changed his name to Abraham, added a few more letters in. And his story is recorded in Genesis chapters 12 through to 25. So we read of Abraham marrying Sarah. Nothing unusual there. I'm sure it was a very happy marriage. And we can read about that in Genesis 12, right at the start of uh, their journey in the Bible. And God promises Abraham many descendants. The Bible says a man should have, talking about children, a man should have a quiver full of them. I don't know how big a quiver is. Um, I've got three and uh, they're fantastic. Um, but however many ch children God blesses you with, and sometimes God doesn't bless us with children, but we can still be parents uh, to other people's children. We can support them and help them and love them because we're part of the wider church family. Did you realize that because you're part of the church family, raising children, parents, is just not your responsibility, but as a church, we come to get together and help uh, and support you. Certainly that was the case when I was young, and I believe that's still the case uh, now. So God promises Abraham many descendants. And at God's command, Abraham takes his family. They move from Ur of the Chaldeans to the land of uh, Canaan. But 10 years go past and no child is born to Sarah. So God's promised Abraham he's going to be a father of many nations. But Sarah, his wife, has no children. So she comes up with a great idea, she thinks. So she gives Hagar, who is her maidservant, to Abraham. And a says to him, look. Go, and go in, when it says go in, it means go and sleep with, uh, to my maidservant Hagar. Perhaps she will conceive and bear you a son. And because of Abraham's actions and Sarah's uh, suggestion and uh, encouraging Abraham to follow through with that, trouble then ensues in chapter 16 and verse 4. So Sarah sees that her maidservant Hagar has conceived. So Sarah can't conceive, but Hagar has conceived. And Sarah despises Hagar uh, for that. And she deals with her harshly. And Hagar flees from the family. And she flees and she meets Jesus. Uh, talks about the angel of the Lord, capital A. You remember when we talked about that a few weeks ago? And it says, uh, capital A for angel of the Lord. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus meets her and tells her to return to the family, which she does. And later, uh, this child, Ishmael, is born. I don't know whether you knew this, but Muslims will trace their lineage to Abraham's son, Ishmael. So if you didn't know that, you've learned that this morning. But all this was not God's plan. God had a plan for Sarah to conceive, which she does in chapter 21. And she gives birth to Isaac, the promised son. And now 
uh, whilst this blended family did not come from divorce or remarriage or death of a partner in remarriage, nevertheless, Abraham has two wives and two sons by each wife. And Genesis 21, 8 to 11 says, So the child grew, this is talking about Isaac, the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. Therefore, she said to Abraham, cast out this bond woman and her son, for the son of this bond woman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of this. And the result of this uh, sin on Sarah and Abraham's part in uh, Abraham and Hagar coming together and Ishmael being born. The result of that uh, was that Hagar and Ishmael were cast out of the family. So here was a type of blended family that didn't happen in the way God wanted it. And the results from that ensued. And there were tensions, there was disharmony because they did things their way, not God's way. And there's a lesson in that for us, not just in family, but whenever we do things our way rather than God's way, often we end up in a right pickle. Second example uh, is King David, and his story is recorded in 1 Samuel 16 um, through to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24. David had many wives. He had eight wives. I can only cope with one, but he had eight, and my one is wonderful. I wouldn't want any others. Uh, quickly, quick dig. dig out. Do you like the way I dug out that? It was like a out scoop, you see. I've many years of practice of digging and uh, getting out. So he had eight wives that are recorded in the Bible. Three are mentioned more than once and feature prominently in his life story. And from those wives come children. And on top of the wives, he has concubines as well. And David was wrong to take more than wife. Did you realize that? Kings of Israel were wrong to take more than one wife. God told them that in Deuteronomy 17, 17. He said, neither shall the king multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. So here's King David, part of this blended family where he has eight wives and lots of children that come from those wives. And some of those problems were that David's son, Absalom, kills his stepbrother Amnon because Amnon raped uh, 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 Absalom's sister Tamar. So Absalom flees for his life. Later, he's put to death against his father's wishes. One of David's other sons tries to take over as king and is later put to death. And believe me, there would have been fighting amongst the children. And whilst we don't read of it, more than likely, tension among the wives. So God's plan for a king of Israel to have one wife, that was something David didn't carry out. He was a man after God's own heart, but he made mistakes. And this was one of his big ones that he made. And so there was always this tension going on in his family because it was a blended family that wasn't done in the way uh, God intended. Thirdly, There is Jesus Christ. Jesus was part of a blended family. Did you know that? He was the son of Mary, not of her seed. And we covered that uh, a couple of weeks ago. And Joseph was his stepdad. And he had these step-siblings too, brothers and sisters. So there must have been this kind of social awkwardness because of the relationships within that family. And so Jesus is teaching in a synagogue one day. And the people say in Mark 6, 3, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And are not his sisters here with us? There's one person left out of that list, and that was Joseph. He wasn't mentioned. Now, it could have been that at that point he had died. But either way, Jesus would still have been classed as the son of Mary and Joseph. They were obviously step-parents. And that would have been insulting not to hear Joseph's name mentioned. So Jesus had to live with these tensions of being part of Uh, a blended family, not least the fact that Mary was pregnant before they actually got married, which was uh, in those days considered a real disgrace. So here are three examples of blended families, but others existed throughout scripture too. So what does God think about blended families? How do we do blended families God's way? Well, in the cases of Abraham and David, uh, their blended families were in disobedience to God. For example, in Abraham's case, he didn't honor God through his choice with Agar. His trying to bring about God's promise his way. He felt God needed a hand. Trust me, God doesn't need a hand in bringing about his promises into our lives. And so, you know, God commanded that there be marriage between one woman and one man. That was laid down in the book of Genesis. And so the union of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar brought all this grief and, and trouble. And then in King David's, King David's case, it would have also been far from pleasing to God because God had said a king should only have one wife. Well, he 
That was his plan for mankind. One man, one woman. That was how marriage was laid down in the Bible. And a classic example of this mistrust and disobedience of David and having these eight wives and all these concubines was that Solomon, his son, who followed after his father as king of Israel, was initially the wisest man, probably apart from Jesus, who'd ever lived, um, but whose carnal desires for many wives, many princesses, many concubines led ultimately to his downfall and the downfall of Israel. That was promised in 1 Kings chapter 9. If you make your notes, you can go and read about it. That's what God said. If you, if you do these things, then the kingdom of Israel is, is going to fall down, basically. And Solomon didn't listen. His heart was led away by all these beautiful women. Jesus' case was obviously very different. He was not the blood child of either Mary or Joseph. Um, and we'll look at that uh, in a couple of weeks' time when we look at the real Christmas story. He was God incarnate, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Nevertheless, he was part of this blended family. But perhaps the greatest example, both in number and diversity and significance of a blended family, is that of the church, of which we are a part. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 10 says this. This is John writing, okay? This is the vision he has. He, John says, After this I looked, and behold... A great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This here, this verse or verses, this is a picture of the worldwide church after the rapture, after we've been taken to heaven. The church is a wonderful picture of a blended family. People from different nations, languages, cultures, backgrounds, characters coming together to worship God and fulfill the Great Commission. And when the church operates in unity, and it will be in unity in heaven, of course, God receives glory in amidst the unique diversity. Our differences as a church and as the worldwide church, so long as they're not against scripture bring a positive and uniquely special offering into the world and that in itself is a witness to the power of God working through us this unique blended family welcomes new believers into its fold every day across the world new people come into the blended family that is uh, the church so there's something unique about the church in that in the worldwide church it draws together people that we wouldn't ordinarily hang out with. That's not, not because we don't like other people. It's just we naturally gravitate, don't we, to people who are like us, maybe have a similar interest to us or, or like you know, similar holidays or similar family structures or similar work uh, situations or whatever. And we, you know, but in a church a situation, it brings people together from all kinds of different backgrounds, different ideas, different cultures, different likes, different dislikes. It's a unique melting pot, if you like, uh, the church. And it's, a, and it's a fantastic thing when it works in unity and harmony. Now, I'm going to come back to the church again in a, in a minute, but I want to just suggest uh, three key areas to be mindful of when we live in a uh, blended family. Oh, there's a picture of the church. I forgot that. There we go. Three things. Uh, three areas. So what does the Bible say about how we should live as blended families? And I would suggest there are things here to say about family units. But because scripture should be a basis for any family, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 through to chapter 6 and verse 4, will give us key biblical principles on which to build those families, whether they're blended families or otherwise. Even for those who are not Christians, that passage offers really sound doctrine and fundamental advice. But in all cases, God would have us display love, respect, and unity as essential elements to have in any family. So let's break them down. The first one is unity. Blended families need to come together in agreement on various matters. I don't know about you, but in our marriage and our family, we have to come to agreement on certain things. And unity is important in any uh, family. Unity is an essential foundation upon which to build a relationship and to raise children. Romans chapter 14 verse 19 says, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. So, so when couples get married, they talk or get together. 
when they talk together and they, they get when they get married, they talk together about all kinds of uh, things and they develop ways to deal with different situations. Their unique differences that they have in their separate families before they come together then come into this new family and they have to talk through those things. And some of those challenges they face could be cultural differences. They could be beliefs on certain aspects of life. They could be differences in the way they believe children should be raised or different views of responsibilities and roles within the marriage or different career paths and how you handle those kind of things. Dealing with finances is often a big one when couples get together. But all this part of this journey is an exciting part of the journey. Sometimes it will cause tension, certainly in our marriage when we talked about the way we handle finances, that caused a bit of tension, which you can ask Joy about later. Um, and especially uh, if there are children coming into that newly created family, in that blended family, some of these matters are, are really important to get right. So unity is important to work towards because it's that firm and secure foundation for any relationship, blended or otherwise, but especially for raising children in a blended family, to have that unity. That doesn't mean we don't necessarily disagree on things. It doesn't mean that we don't show our children that we disagree on things because it's helpful for our children to learn about how we can disagree, but then how we work through that in a constructive way so that they learn. You see, your children, did you realize your children are watching how you do things so that they learn when they grow up? There are so many things that I learned when I'm watching my parents and that I used to say when I was young, when I am a parent, I will do it differently. And now I am a parent, I do it the same as I was taught. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of you will be exactly the same. The second thing to be aware of uh, is mindfulness. Another thing we need to bear in mind, particularly when we have children, is how they feel about the idea of being a part of a blended family. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, um, it says this, Paul's writing, and he says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, if you're coming together in a blended family, the children you may, bringing into, may be bringing into that from, from one side or indeed both sides, they may be excited about having a new dad or a new mum or maybe new stepbrothers and sisters. But equally, they may also have trauma from the loss of a previous parent or even parents sometimes. So great care must be taken that any children that are brought into a blended family know that they are not just tagalongs, but they are loved, they are cherished, that they are valued, and they are equally important members of this newly created family unit. We also need to make a real effort to avoid what Mike Mazzalongo calls the co-conductor pitfall. So if you're in a blended family, this is what he means. He means two families that come together as a supposed blended family, but what they really are are just two families living under one roof. This is what he says. He says, when they remarry, the temptation is to try and maintain these independent lifestyles of parenting from previous families or integrate the styles instead of re-establishing a single new system uh, for everyone. And so sometimes if we do that, if we come into a blended family, if perhaps we've gone through a divorce or our partner has died and we meet somebody else and there are children involved, we've got to rework things out and replan it. And sometimes that's easier when you come together as boyfriend, girlfriend, and, and you get married and you've not had any children, you've never been married before, and you kind of carve the way out for yourselves, unique but I've often thought, I mean, Joy and I sort of, I was going to say, have an agreement. We, we've said to each other that if one of us died, we'd want the other one to be happy. We were happy for whoever of us was left to go. And if we felt that it was right to get married again and God brought someone into our lives for us to do that and not feel condemned about that. But the older I get, I realize that actually to, to live with someone else and get married to someone else, and I'm sure Joy is the same, I'd be really like, well, this is how we do it. This, this is how I do this aspect of life. This is how I take the waste food bin out. This is how I hoover. This is what I want to do in life. And you realize as you get older, you kind of become a little bit selfish about how you do things. And so you have to work harder to, uh, to when you get older to sort of meet someone else and blend in with their ways of doing things. And sometimes I start again in terms of carving out that new method, new way of living together. It, it can be a challenge, but it can also uh, be great fun as well. I'm hoping that neither of us die. That's what I'm hoping. Um, you know, that, that Jesus comes back and it's all good and we don't have to die because I, I couldn't live without my wife. Um, oh, he's doing it for the old <laughs> I was actually serious about that. But as you see, I couldn't be alone. Thirdly, respect and honor. 
Respect and honour. The older we get, she didn't look at that. The older we get, the more settled in our ways we get. I've kind of touched on this, but this, that can be an added dimension to the challenges of a blended family. See, sometimes as people get older, either the husband or the wife dies, and, and it sometimes happens to younger couples as well, so we're not just, but often as we get older, uh, life kind of works its way out and, and one of us dies. We're all headed that way, right? We know that. But for older couples who may have grown up children with their own children, this new blended family can at times cause tensions. And the longer we spend with our spouse, the older we get, the closer we get, the more familiar we are, and the more our lives are entwined, both as a couple, but also as a children. That's very often why when you see people who are really old that are still married and one of them dies, the other one dies sooner. And they call it dying of a broken heart, which I understand is actually a medical uh, condition that people have uh, discovered. But it can be, if, we, if one of us dies when we get older and we have older children, it can become much harder for the older person, certainly the older children, to accept someone new into the family. It can be a real challenge. But Paul says, in what he writes to the Romans, he says, love one another with brotherly, brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor, in Romans 12.10. We've got to show honor to one another, right? We've got to love one another, love our elders. If you're here and you're older this morning, I know sometimes I have a joke with some of you who are older. Sorry, Val. Um, but I, it's just, you know, I just, I just, you know, you guys teach us so much. And you're such an essential part of the family. And certainly for us with children, uh, for those of you who are older, um, you know, one of the great things you can do is to pray for our younger people and pray for our children. You've walked the path of life. And yes, life changes and the pressures in life change. But guys, you know, although there are kind of different things in one sense, the root of these things is very much the same. So please, if you're older, get on your knees, not pray if you can. Uh, <laughs> just realize we... You had a knee, a knee replacement, D. Sorry, you don't get on your knees because they, they tell you that's not the thing you're supposed to do. But I'll sit on your bed or whatever. Just pray, okay? Just pray um, for our younger people. You have so much uh, to give. I'm not like normal pastors, trust me. Right, um, the third thing I want to say to you about blended families this morning, um, and coming back to the church, because that is the, the largest type of blended family in the world, I'd suggest. And the, we need to work harder than any other type of blended family. Just look around at yourself and look at your brothers and sisters in Christ here in this place. You are part of this blended family. And we've got other brothers and sisters who are part of this blended family just down the road at MKCC, who incidentally are having 20 people baptized this morning. Isn't that great? I can't remember the last time we had someone baptized. We're a Baptist church, right? So, you know, this uh, is not looking good. So we need to do something about that. But, um, and, and we've got brothers and sisters up in Stony Stratford, in Wolverton, in Bletchley. We've got brothers and sisters everywhere in this town. Uh, sorry, city. We're a city now in this city and across the country and across the world. So why do we need to work harder perhaps than any other blended family? Here are some things. Firstly, Satan desires the downfall of the church, right? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, you'll know this verse. It says, be sober, uh, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he de may devour. So the church is Jesus' bride-to-be. We've talked about that, hasn't it? That Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is the bride. Jesus loves the church. He founded the church. So if Satan can cause disharmony and hurt and pain and destruction in the church, he will do. Because not only does it hurt us, but Satan knows it hurts Jesus Christ as well. So we need to work hard at this. And when we have tensions and disharmony, we need to look beyond the person and see where Satan is bringing this thing. What is Satan doing behind the scenes? Because he'll be the one stirring things up, believe me. And he will pick on those things where we've got areas of our pain in our life. Often the roots of the things that are causing tensions, if we look in our own life, can go way back. Those roots that we never dealt with them and they'll come back again and they'll keep coming back until we deal with them. And if you say, oh, I've had enough and you leave the church, believe me, your problems will follow you and you'll come again and again and again until you deal with the root of that problem. So we've got to be mindful because Satan desires the downfall of the church um, and we need to be wise and say, do you know what? Jesus died for the church. He died for me. He died for you. So we're not going to go down that route of disharmony. We're not going to go down that route of causing hurt and pain. And we're going to make every effort to live in unity and live in harmony. The second thing in the church is there is great diversity. We are so diverse. Re Revelation 7, 9, we read it earlier on. A great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. What I'd love to do one Sunday, actually, is send a clipboard around for you to write down what 
uh, country you were, you were born in or your heritage is or that sort of thing because we have so many different cultures represented in this church and that is fantastic because you teach us if you're from different cultures you we all teach stuff uh, teach each other some amazing stuff not to mention when we have uh, meals and things like the Christmas party coming up in two weeks time great different types of food amen there is some wonderful food uh, that I love. Uh, and there's such great diversity. But with that great diversity can come tensions because different cultures do things in different ways. And when we move to a country, if I was to go to some other country, I wouldn't necessarily adopt their culture straight away. Um, and so I would do things my way. And some people come here and do things their way. And that can cause tensions. But in the family of God, the blended family of God called the church, we need to work hard to make sure that those differences become strengths and not weaknesses. They're positive things. They're not negative that bring us down. Third thing, we have different uh, perspectives on things. We have a variety of different views on various areas of Scripture. And that can cause disagreements and even church splits that we've known over the years. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 to 32 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiveness can be a really hard thing to do. And you're like, I'm not ready to forgive yet. But what you can do is say to God, God, I need to forgive this person. I'm really struggling to forgive this person. Help me. So as I'm struggling with some forgiveness, help me to come to that place of forgiveness. Don't just leave it until you get round to it. Ask God to help you work on uh, that process um, because that can be a real strength. And we have to be mindful of the different views uh, there are in this church. We can agree to disagree in love, can we not? Fourth thing is, some of you weren't sure on that one. Fourth thing is <laughs> leadership. We all have a tendency to want to lead, right? And in the church, God has given gifts to people to lead. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. Some people say that's a five-fold ministry gift. I call it the four-fold because pastors and teachers is, I think, quite, is one and the same. But anyway, whatever you think about that, uh, we all have a tendency to lead. We don't always have the respect for those who lead, right? We, we think we're right. We think we can do better, particularly if we are in leadership in perhaps our jobs or our careers. Uh, and in some cases, we can inappropriately challenge people in leadership. Now, that's not to say we're not, leadership shouldn't be accountable. That's not to say people can't, with respect, challenge leadership and hold us to account because we see what happens when it doesn't happen. But it's about honoring our leaders. And it's not just me saying that. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, in the New Living Translation, it says, Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy. And not sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Fifth thing, uh, and lastly on this thing, is a wrong focus. See, I think as a church, and I think this is a key thing, we often have a wrong focus because we don't see ourselves as a blended family. The church, I think, so often sees itself as a club, as a group of people of a common interest. The common interest here would be, oh, we were Christians, we all come together. And therefore, the unity that God calls us to have is not felt to be a priority for us to work, work towards. And also, you know, when we ask for help, as Carrie did just so eloquently just earlier on and stuff, we believe others will do it, right? How many times have you sat there and someone said, we could do with help in that? Oh, well, someone else will do it. In your own parochial families, and we'll want to say parochial, I'm talking like husband, wife, 2.4 children, or whatever your family was like, maybe it's a blended family, whatever. We were all part of a family at some point before you became part of the family uh, of the church. Did you say, oh, someone else will do it? Now, maybe when you were young, you did. Like me and my sisters, we'd argue about who was doing the washing up. It's like, I'm not doing it. She can do it because it's her turn. Anyone been there? <laughs> Come on, it's not just me, is it? No. My old sister always used to get away with it. I don't know why. She's not here to defend herself, so I'm going to say that. Um, but, you know, you know, when we ask for that help, we believe that others will do it. Or we say, we say oh, I'm too busy. You know, a number of people tell me they're too busy. I'm too busy too. But the thing is, we're in control of what we're busy about, right? We get upset and we stop doing what we're doing. So, oh, someone said that. I'm not going to do that anymore. Or we leave and we go somewhere else, as I said earlier, with our problems following us and repeating. And we do these things, and this is really important, this is really key. So if you remember nothing else from this morning, remember this. We do those things because we think our service is for other people. 
If you, if you go out and sign up and volunteer because Carrie said so or because I have asked you to or something else, then, then you're going to have problems. You're going to give up. It's, it's a big red flag if you think, well, I'm doing it because they've asked. No, no. You do it because it's your service to God. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So when you go out and you clean the toilets, you're not doing it for me. I mean, I like a nice clean toilet, but you're not doing that for me. You're doing it for God. Because that's what God's called you to do. If you're up here playing in the worship band, you're doing it because God has called you to. He's given you a gift and he wants you to do it. If you're up here hosting, if you're serving teas and coffees, if you're working with the children or the young people, if you're going out with a grabber and you're collecting up rubbish from outside in the car park, if you're mowing the lawn, if you're cleaning the building, if you're fixing patio slabs or light bollards outside as we had to do the other day, whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter how big it is, how small it is, in God's eyes there is no grade. It's just we're serving in the family and we're doing it for God. Get that in your heads, people, okay? I'm not saying you've not got it in your heads. I'm just encouraging you strongly. And I'm saying this to me, okay, as well. Because sometimes I'm like, oh, they, they've asked me to help. Oh, okay, I'm too tired. I haven't got time. I'm too busy. If God calls you to do something, you will find the time because you should want to do it for him. And if you don't want to do it for him, then there's some issue in your heart you need to get sorted out. Remember, there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. You can get before God and say, why is it? God, what is it in my life? Why don't I want to surrender to you? Because that's what it's about, bottom line, surrendering ourselves to God. It's not about God being this big bad boss over us that beats us around and won't let us rest. God loves us. He knows what's best for us. But surrender your life to God. Whatever you do, do it for God. Don't go out there about for the gift aid. Oh, because Carrie said, or I've been banging on about it for the past four weeks. You know, when Anne sits out there at that table and Jenny's going to join this morning, Anne and Jenny are doing that for God. That's all part of it. We're doing it for God. Colossians 3, 22, 24 says, And whatever you do, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. You're going to get a reward for it. Cleaning the toilets. Guys, you're going to get a reward for cleaning the toilets. You're going to get a reward if you clean rubbish up in the car park. You're going to get a reward if you make a wonderful cake for me for my birthday tomorrow. <laughs> you get, no, don't. You get, I'll get too fat. Um, but you get a reward. It's not just, oh, I've got to do It's not servitude. God sees what you do. Do it for the Lord and he will bless you. As we said earlier, love, respect, and unity are essential characteristics that God wants us to have, whether it be blended families of husband, wife, and 2.4 children, or the larger blended family of the church. God is glorified when there is unity among his people. Amen? Amen. And so in conclusion, as we bring this thing into land, I love that expression, there are some, who's got a, who's got a mobile phone with a camera on it? You've got it with you? Get it out. Point it at that screen. I'm going to move out the way so you don't get me. Get a picture of that. Because now you go, oh, that's a nice sermon, Pastor, and we forget it over lunch, right? Take a picture of that. There are some help, helpful things for you. Go and read the Bible, Ephesians 5, 22 ver- through to chapter 6 and verse 4. I mentioned that earlier. There's a link there for care for the family, which can help in all kinds of family matters. Bible Talk TV, there's a link there that talks about blended families and things to watch out for. And in Crosswalk as well, there's another one. That's a long um, thing. That's why I say take a photo, because then you can go and type it in. Fam- oh. <laughs> Getting cooked, cooked up on the Christmas tree there. There we go. Blended families come in all kinds of ways. And sometimes they come about in ways that do not honor God. It can also come about in ways that do honor God. They come with their own unique challenges. They require work. They require love. They require patience and understanding. And God's word helps us in all these and other things too. I believe that we were created to live in family. And I'm not just talking about husband and wife and kids. I'm talking about the church family. That was God's plan. And if we live as God calls us to live, to honor him and our family, then I believe We will live under the blessing of God. Family, it's God's idea. It's his creation. So do family God's way. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that we are part of this wider, blended family. We just thank you that, Father, even though sometimes we struggle because we are from different backgrounds, different cultures, different ideas. And, Father, we are like this big melting pot. And that can be such a blessing. We're in unity. But, Father, sometimes we know we rub each other up the wrong way. And I pray, Father, that you just give us that heart of compassion and love for one another. Father, just 
give us an excitement to get to know people who are perhaps different to us, who think differently than us, who, who do things differently than us. Father, just may you use this church and the church worldwide, but this church as an example of what it looks like when so many people come together with a common interest and a common purpose where you, Father God, are the head of our church family. You're the one we look to. Father, we want to say we love you this morning. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name that if we remember nothing else for this morning, we remember that everything we do is not done because someone has asked us. It's done because you have asked us and we're serving you. And that, Father, we know we will receive a reward. So we want to serve you diligently, Father. We want to invest. We want to help our brothers and sisters. Father, forgive us when we've said we're too busy, when we're too tired, when we're too everything else. And yet we have the energy to do things we want to do. Father, help us to remember that as a family, we want to serve one another. We want to care for one another. We want to love one another. And most of all, we do it because we're honoring and serving you, our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this morning's service. It's been great to have you with us. I just wanted to very briefly share with you how you can give your heart to Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus. I became a Christian when I was eight years old at a kid's summer holiday club. And it was an amazing time. And I remember praying a very simple prayer and I remember the feeling in my heart, in my life, that I just had that feeling inside of me. Something changed when Jesus came into my life. And the great thing is that when we do it, when we ask Jesus into our life, he doesn't just add it onto his to-do list. It happens straight away, straight away. And it's just, it's, it's the best decision we could make in life. You can change the trajectory of your life when you ask him in. And when he comes in, he comes in to, to be your friend, to be your Lord, to be your savior, to be your helper in difficult times. And you know, I've been through some incredibly difficult times in my life, but I know that God has helped me every step of the way. Jesus has been with me every step of the way. And when I've had important decisions to make, I've prayed about them. And Jesus has helped me to make the right decision. When I've gone through tough times, he's comforted me and enabled me to get through those difficult times where otherwise I probably would have taken another course of action, but he's helped me in those times. And so when I was eight years old, I remember praying a very simple prayer and, and the prayer involved just these few simple sentences. I asked Jesus to forgive me. I admitted that I'd done something wrong. I repented of my sin. And I made that 180 degree turn to start following him. And so if you want to do that this morning, if you want to take that step, then I want to help you pray that prayer. So if you're ready for that now, let's do it now. So just pray after me. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I have sinned. I recognize that I've done my life my way. I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I repent of my sin. Please come into my life. I choose right here, right now to make that 180 degree turn and start following you and living my life the way you would want me to. Please come into my life to be my Lord and Saviour. And if you've prayed that, then that's then fantastic. I'm so pleased for you that you've changed the trajectory of your life. You have made the most important decision you could make in your entire life. But I want you to do two things for me. The first thing is this. I want you to get in contact with me and let me know that you've prayed that prayer. And the reason is because then we can be accountable to one another. We can support one another. So when you send me an email, the email address will come up at the bottom of the screen. I can get back in touch with you and I can send you some, some information to help you uh, on your journey as a new Christian. The second thing I want you to do is to get into a good church. Now I don't know where you live, if you live in Milton Keynes you're welcome to come to Shenley Christian Fellowship or there are other great churches in this city that you can be a part of. But if you live at other places in the country then I want to try and help you find the church to be a part of. It's important that we're part of a church which is welcoming 
a church that teaches the Bible, a church that believes in great worship, and also a church that will help you on your journey as a Christian. We call it discipleship, but, but it's basically teaching us how to, how to live our life as a Christian. And so I wanna help you do that if I possibly can. So thank you for being with us this morning. I'm so pleased that you made that step, but if you haven't prayed that prayer and you still need time to think, then I want to encourage you to think it through. And I want to encourage you to pray and ask Jesus and say, can you help me in making this decision? Because he will do that. And, uh, and we, I just want to bless you this morning. So just take care and stay safe.